My neighbors don't seem to grasp the concept that a car slash motorbike engine is something that can be turned off. Sometimes engines go for, I'm not kidding. Oh, wow, you've stopped. You found the key. Well done. Um, yeah, I've had like 20 minutes of car engines going on down there. And there used to be a guy who's moved out, thank God, but he would do this every Saturday afternoon, hoover his car for up to three hours. How dirty does your car need to be every Saturday? What did you do to make it dirty enough that it required hoovering for three, I'm, I'm honestly not kidding, three hours every Saturday outside my window? How? I am moving house soon. I'm honestly genuinely looking forward to that. Anyway, Arthur by um, Kevin Crossley Holland. So Kevin Crossley Holland is an English translator, poet and children's author who wrote uh, the Arthur series, which is his most famous piece of work which was translated into 25 languages. So the first novel in the series is The Seeing Stone, which tells the story of young Arthur, a boy who is a page in the year 1199. He lives in England uh, near the border of Wales and is the son of a lord and as such is required to learn a certain amount of skills, how to serve his father as a page how to fight. He takes lessons with the priests on how to read and write and even helps out his best friend Gatti, who's a simple peasant girl on his father's estate, with her chores. At this young age, Arthur already has a lot of things to deal with, including his engagement to one of his cousins, his, the question of his inheritance and his lifelong dream of becoming a knight. Arthur has an older brother, Sol, who is a squire, and they have an awkward relationship. Sol seems to really hate Arthur for some reason, and he often kind of is really mean to him and often plays tricks on him. He also seems to think that helping out his best friend Gatti, being friends with a peasant girl and doing peasant's work is something that's beneath him and that he shouldn't do. Arthur is also friends with a rather strange man called Merlin who lives on his father's land and he enjoys going to see him and debating with him. One day Merlin gives him a very precious gift, an obsidian stone, telling him that this is the most precious thing he will ever own. He is also told to keep this stone a secret and not show it to anyone, so Arthur obeys these rules a bit confused at first before one day looking into the stone and seeing a story unfold inside it. It tells the story of another young boy called Arthur whose life seems to mirror his own in a certain number of ways. But this boy in the stone became king of England by pulling a magical stone out of a sword. And so boy Arthur sees King Arthur, the legendary King of England story unfolds inside this magic stone. At the crossing places. A year later, Arthur is made a squire in the service of Lord Stephen, who is intent on joining the Crusades. But before they can leave on this holy endeavour, Arthur needs a certain amount of preparations to be made. He needs a horse, a suit of armour, and also to perfect his battle skills. He also has to face some rather distressing truths about himself, his life and his history. He has many things to deal with and during all of this time he is still watching King Arthur's story unfold inside the Seeing Stone, his story that surprisingly mirrors his own. 
king of the middle marsh two years have passed and arthur has finally joined the crusade he is stationed along with thousands of other soldiers who've come from all over europe on an island near venice where they await the ships that will take them to the holy land during his stay arthur learns many things such as mounting an, exp an expedition of this size requires an awful lot of means that his fellow soldiers although supposedly fighting in the name of the lord don't always abide by his ways and do the just thing he also learns that saracens despite being enemies of the church are allowed to trade in venice and southern europe on peaceful terms and do so with quite a lot of welcome he also learns that the religious authorities who are the ones who encourage them to go on these crusades can in fact manipulate these armies as they wish in return for gold and promises of shipping them to the holy wars they're destined to Okay, we're not in any hurry. So the religious authority who is financing their endeavour, instead of sending them straight to Jerusalem, sends them to recapture the city of Zara uh, for basically commercial and financial reasons. And so, yeah, it does kind of bring forth a lot of questions to young Arthur. Is this really, am I really doing this in the name of the Lord? It gets a bit weird. In the end, Lord Stephen is wounded and Arthur is forced to return with him to England without ever setting foot in Jerusalem. But despite all the horrible actions he has witnessed and been forced to participate in, he doesn't lose his faith and still carries on believing in the way of the Lord and forcing himself to do the right thing, what he believes is right. He never kind of, he has this very kind of clear distinction of right and wrong, which all the way through his story, you know, a lot of things happen that he seems to think is unfair, but hey, this is just the way it is. So he is a character who really does a lot of, he has a very kind of deep thought process. And all of this time he's followed the story of King Arthur via his seeing stone. He's seen him rise to the position of king at a very young age. He's seen him set up the round table with all the knights. He's watched them fight, betray, die, love. And, you know, he... I think it's a lovely kind of way of telling the story of King Arthur via a story of someone else so you've kind of got both stories sort of going on in parallel at the same time and uh, and he sees everything he sees their quest for the holy grail and you know there's always this sort of you know god's always hanging over everyone and at the end of arthur's story he realizes that this whole legend that he's seen unfold ties into the stories he was told as a child by his grandmother so I came across this uh, book the first time when I was in secondary school, so about 17, 18 years ago probably, and because we in the second year we were studying medieval history and the thing about France, I don't know what, how this goes on in other countries, but if you study something in history in like the French classes, the language classes, they try and get stuff to sort of tie in with that. So while we were studying medieval history in history classes, we were also studying medieval literature in French and encouraged to read sort of books about medieval stuff. And I remember this trilogy having, there was only two books out at the time, I think, but I remember it having a, a really kind of big effect on all the kids. This was one of the ones that went around everybody um, and, and, and I read them too. And I think it was, you know, this was the only book that we had in all the medieval collection that was actually told from the point of view of a young boy who was the same age as us. And, you know, it's always nicer when you're, you're especially when you're a kid, to have something that you can relate to. It's very, very, I think it's, like, it's written in a lovely way that kind of makes it easy to read, but also goes into a lot of detail, obviously a lot of research 
uh, went into this and you've got one chapter I think in book three that is just a great big long list of everything that they take with them on the ships when they go to Zara it's just this huge great long list of all the food and the clothes and the animals and everything all the weapons everything that's it that's what it is it's an insanely long list and um and you know you've also got the story of king arthur so this story going on inside a story and everyone loves the legend of king arthur come on everyone loves that uh so this sort of new telling of it um being seen by this young boy through a magic stone and you've got all the aspects of life you know in, in medieval times you've got what it's like for the children the the lords the castles the religious side of things how they all live how they kind of relate to the peasants and, uh, and then you've got the Crusades, and you've got Arthur's journey from a page all the way through to a knight. Uh, so you've got this lovely kind of, you know, sort of logical path he goes through and all the stuff that, you know, his personal life that he has to deal with. So all in all, this is a lovely series, which I think is, you know, nice to read as a kid. And I did enjoy coming back to it as an adult because um, I hadn't read the, the, the last one, Gatti's Tale. So I wanted to read all the rest of it to kind of fully immerse myself like I say I read this about at least 17 years ago it's been a while and um so yeah it's, it is a really good series well worth a look so there is another book to this series which is like a sequel this is Gatti's Tale the young the story of the young peasant girl right at the beginning who's Arthur's best friend and she has her own book which I thought was charming because she is a lovely character um because she's just a peasant girl she has no education no knowledge of anything and but she's still like this very kind of intelligent and curious character who is also very brave and uh, and she has her own book which i will come back and talk about in another video otherwise this is probably going to be 10 hours long i have a lot to say about this a lot more i actually liked it more than i did the arthur series so yeah i'll get back to you on that so this was the Arthur trilogy by Kevin Crossley Holland, which is the lovely story of a young page who becomes a knight. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed making it. I got a huge buzz out of this. And, uh, and I will see you all soon, I hope. Bye.